This is our last study before Nativity, before the celebration of Nativity. And we are in Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be enrolled. This was the first enrollment when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be enrolled, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. So we know from looking at Luke and also Matthew's gospel, that Joseph is, a, is from Nazareth, right? He's from Nazareth, but... Uh, a lineage wise, he's of the house of David, right? So all the house of David or the house of Jesse all come from Bethlehem, right? You remember in First Samuel chapter sixteen when Nathan, uh, when, I'm sorry, when Samuel went to anoint the uh, went to anoint a replacement for Saul, he goes to Be- to Bethlehem, right? So then the uh, this is where Joseph has to go. He has to go back because for tax purposes, of course, the Roman Empire is keeping track of these things. Now, uh, it says that when, they, um, when they're in Bethlehem, verse 7, she gave birth to her firstborn son. Highlight the word firstborn there. Firstborn, and then also highlight the words swaddling, swaddling clothes. And laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Now this spot, it's called Shepherd's Field. If you go on a pilgrimage, uh, if you go this summer with us to the pilgrimage to the Holy Land, we'll stand right there on a hill overlooking the little, little, a very small little valley called Shepherd's Field. And just up the hill is the place where Jesus was born. Up the hill is Bethlehem. Shepherd's Field is just on the outskirts of the town. Unfortunately, you better hurry because there's an Israeli settlement which is slowly taking over what's called Shepherd's Field. So another five, ten years, Shepherd's Field will be gone. It'll be a big Israeli neighborhood. All right. Uh, chapter 2, verse 9. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were filled with fear. They were filled with fear, right? Filled with fear. Why would they be filled with fear? They're just cute little baby angel things flying around in the sky, right? No. Obviously, the um, uh, the angels they're seeing are not Renaissance or post-Renaissance artistic renditions of Cupid that infected Christian art in that uh, in the last 500 years, but rather they're seeing angels. And you know, in the Bible, when angels appear, usually someone dies. We already talked about this in the story of Zechariah when he sees the angel stand at the right side of the altar of incense. Last week we talked about this in Luke chapter one. He was filled with fear. Right? When angels show up, usually they appear to you in the church, in the, in the temple or somewhere else. Usually someone's gonna die because they did something wrong. Think of the sons of Aaron turning into balls of flames when they offered incense improperly in the book of Leviticus, chapter 10. And so it says in Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, verse 10, the angel said to them, be not afraid, don't worry, we're not going to kill you. Don't run, we've got a message for you. We have good news, not bad news. Good news of great joy which will come to all people. For To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior. Now when you hear the word Savior, what do you think of? We usually think of that in modern Christian terminology, which is fine as long as your modern term of Christology, uh, uh, your, your language, your terminology is based in the Old Testament. Savior was the king, the guy who saved you from your enemies. Remember, in the Old Testament, if you're an Israelite, your enemy, the Philistines, the Moabites, the Midianites, these people came and tried to kill you. 
And so the enemy was the one who could take your life. But Jesus, as we see in Matthew's gospel, this, this savior, this king who's going to save you from your enemies is going to save you from your sin because it's sin that cannot kill the body, but can kill the soul much more dangerous than a Philistine. And so it says, I, we bring you good news of great joy, which will come to all people for Jew is born today in, in the city of David, a savior that is a king that's going to save you from your enemies, who is the Christ, the anointed one. We've talked about this already a number of times in this study. The word Christ, of course, is the title for the king of the Old Testament. He was anointed. We first see this in reference to Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 12, when the oil was poured on his head in a previous chapter, 10, when the, the Holy Spirit came upon him. And so they're called the anointed one, the king, the Messiah, Hamashiach in the Hebrew, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed king of Israel, not the oily one so much. Obviously, the oil would wash off after they took a bath, but it was the spirit. The oil was just an outward sign of an inward change. He said, that sounds kind of sacramental. Well, yeah, of course it does. So the, uh, that's recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 10. In chapter 12, he's called, this is Saul, he's called the Christ, the Messiah. After three strikes, he's out, he messed up. So they anoint a new king, that is David. From there on out, as you know, David receives a special promise once he becomes the king of Israel. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, that only his sons would have the right to rule over the people of Israel and Jerusalem. That's why it's so important in the New Testament you hear these references to son of David. That's the fulfillment of that promise. Only the son of David had the right to rule over the people of Israel because of the promise God had given David in 2 Samuel 7. Okay, so he is the Christ, the Lord. This is the one they've been waiting for, right? They've been waiting for the Messiah. They've been waiting for the return of the Messiah, the restoration of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God had been destroyed, remember, since the Babylonians had conquered it. And there had not been a king on the throne of the kingdom of God, at least a human king, uh, for 500 years. But now they've got a human king is on the throne. But what we're going to find out is this human king is also the divine king that they had from before they had a human king. So it says, uh, you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes. This is Luke chapter 2, verse 12. Wrapped in swaddling clothes. See that? What's, what's, what else are you going to wrap a baby in? How are you going to find this kid out of all the other kids? Wrapped in swaddling clothes, that's what you're wrapping. You wrap them in a towel, a blanket. So swaddling clothes is probably intended for us to think back to a reference in what's called wisdom, the book of wisdom. If you go back to wisdom, wisdom chapters 7 through 9, a really important section in the book of wisdom. And in wisdom chapter 9, we hear that the word of God is the wisdom of God through which he created the world. And then we also hear in chapter 7 of the book of wisdom, Solomon speaking. He says, I am a king like all other kings, and all kings are like all other men. We were all born uh, from a woman, you know, just like anyone else. But and, and all kings are like all their babies when they're born. They're just wrapped in swaddling clothes. But I was different. I prayed for wisdom and I received it. I know remember the wisdom of God is the word of God. So this is Solomon. So Luke is probably hoping we're going to think back to this image because a very important image in the Gospels is Jesus, the son of David. The first son of David is Solomon who built the house for the Lord, the temple. But that temple was destroyed. Jesus is going to build a, a temple, a house for the Lord, which the gates of Hades will not prevail. This is in Matthew 16. Jesus is going to say, Behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Hint, hint. He'll talk about building a house on a rock versus on sand. That's Solomon imagery. A lot of Solomon typology in the New Testament that we often miss. Okay, so then it says in verse 13, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly armies, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased, or men of goodwill. 
however you want to translate it. But you don't want to translate it this way, as we often get in the nice song that you hear during this time of year. Uh, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and good will among men. No, it's peace among men of good will, right? You can only have peace where there is men of good will, or, as you get in some translations, with whom God is pleased, right? If you're living in accord with God's will, then you have peace on earth. Peace among men. If there's peace between man and God, then there's peace among men. Verse 15, When the angels went from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go over and to Bethlehem and see this thing. Again, from there, from the spot where they were, up to the cave, they were running. You know, they had to go uphill, probably in good shape, maybe 10 minutes. It's not very far. Verse 21. At the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So eighth day. So we're going to find all the way through the life of Jesus. He lives a life in perfect accord with the law. He fulfills the law. He is the law. So, remember in Genesis chapter 17, Abraham received the law of circumcision. So, verse 22, also, any firstborn son, on the 40th day, had to be presented. There were special sacrifices associated. So, in verse 22, when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as is written the law of the Lord, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. That's why you get firstborn back in chapter 2, verse 7. Now, I have you highlight that, uh, and ordinarily there's not a, a need to talk about it as you read the text. It's quite obvious. But occasionally you do have, find someone who is confused by this text when they hear that Jesus was the firstborn back in chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 7. Firstborn? Well, if he's firstborn, there must be a secondborn, right? And a thirdborn, a fourthborn, a fifthborn, hence the brothers and sisters of Jesus in the New Testament. No. There's no possible way to read it that way. Even John Calvin criticizes such an interpretation. John Calvin, in his commentary, points out this. He says, look, he's called firstborn, because of what the text says. He's the firstborn. He's the one that opens the womb. If firstborn meant, as we often hear it maybe in American modern English, outside of the biblical context, the first among many who will be born, the first, the one before the second born and third born, then you have a problem. And that is you can't offer a sacrifice of the firstborn until the second or third would be born. Otherwise, it would be presumption. The whole thing's ridiculous, of course. You offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving for a firstborn son because this is a sign that the family will continue. Back then, those old, in those uh, days, dad didn't live very long. 40 years on average, 45, 50 year old guy would be pretty old back then. And so you had to have a boy who was born very early in the marriage. You got married early. You hoped and prayed that a boy would come out of that womb early. And so that that way you knew that when dad started to get old or weak or died, there would be a son who'd be big and strong enough to protect that household and that piece of property and continue the family line. Today things are obviously quite different, but that's what's going on here. So, they uh, offered a sacrifice in accordance with that. Thanksgiving, uh, verse 23. Chapter 2, verse 24. Luke chapter 2, verse 24. And to offer the sacrifice according to the law, which it says, uh, and then they offered a pair of turtle doves. So, pigeons. Why? Because this is an allowance for the poor. Normally, you're supposed to offer a lamb. But a lamb was very expensive, you know, today you go buy a yearling lamb, it's going to cost you about $150, $200. So that's a lot of money for some, for a poor family. And so, um, uh, and so they, you know, if you transfer that into their context there, so there was an allowance they could offer two doves or two pigeons, which would be, you know, more in the realm of maybe five, ten dollars or something. For the poor, of course, this is a lot of money even that. It says there was a man named Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel. Right? They're waiting for the coming of the restoration of the kingdom. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. 
The Holy Spirit was upon him. Look at this. The Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not uh, see death before he had seen the Christ, the Lord's Christ. And inspired by the Spirit, he came into the temple. Spirit, Spirit, Spirit. Why, is, why do you see the Holy Spirit here? We've already seen it earlier in Luke's Gospel. The Holy Spirit is spilling out all over the place, right? Zechariah filled the Holy Spirit. John the Baptist filled the Holy Spirit. What's going on? Why is the Spirit here? We talked about this last week. Remember, the Christ, the anointed one, is the one, the oily one, right? They anointed him with oil, and he had the Spirit. He had the Spirit of God to lead him to rule over God's people and to fight their battles for them and all that stuff. So the anointed one, the Christ, Hamashiach, the the O Christos, you can't think of that idea without thinking of the Spirit. This is the man, the, uh, the king of Israel, who is filled with the Spirit of God. And so now that the Messiah has returned, the Christ has returned, now the Spirit is unleashed upon God's people again. And so Luke shows us, as does Paul, and of course their literature is very closely linked because Luke was a disciple of Paul, that the Spirit comes with the coming of the Messiah. This is, of course, what Luke's going to show us in the sequel at the beginning of Acts the Apostles, He's going to show us the Spirit is now going to be unleashed on all of God's people. All of them, not just the king or a prophet here or there or the priest, but upon all of God's people. This is, of course, why we are called Christians, right? Anointed ones filled with the Spirit, as John points out in his first epistle. Okay, chapter 2. Verse 29, having taken the babe in his arms, he said, Lord, now let us out thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast preserved, uh, prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation of the Gentiles, and for the glory of thy people Israel. And he hands the baby back. Now, when do you hear this hymn in the church? This is at the end of our services. At some of our liturgical services conclude with this beautiful prayer. Why? Uh, because we've now seen this, right? In the midst of the liturgical service, when we've gathered together to pray to the Lord, and we hear the Scriptures, and the Eucharistic services, of course, we receive His body and blood. There, the presence of God is among God's people. The presence of God is here by the power of the Spirit wherever Christians are gathered, as Jesus says, right? Where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. And so at the end of many of our liturgical services, we conclude with this beautiful prayer of St. Simeon. There's also another beautiful place where uh, you see it is at the conclusion of the baptismal service. Right at the end of the baptismal service, the priest takes the baby and brings him into the temple. Right In the Eastern tradition, we call what is often called the church, the church building, we call it the temple. It's a place where God dwells among his people, right? And so we gather together to praise him. And we come, he brings the baby into the temple, into the church, and he lays the baby on the holy table or on the altar there, right? You probably have seen this. And he turns around, hands the baby back to the mother, and then says this prayer. Now I have seen, you can dismiss me now because I have seen your salvation, O Lord. I've seen your Christ. How is that? Well, because of what we believe baptism is, right? As St. Paul says in Galatians 3.27, in which we sing beautifully at that service, all of you have been baptized into Christ, right? Have put on Christ like a garment, a robe of glory, Return to the Garden of Eden, robed in the glory of God. And so, uh, in the, of course, you can think of all sorts of other passages in Paul where he talks about this idea that the baptized Christian is the member of the church, a member of the body of Christ. So you can newly baptize. In fact, you often see in uh, some churches, you'll see uh, in our Melkite churches, usually you'll see when the baby's baptized, that everyone tries to go up and kiss the baby after the service. Uh, because this is, this is, they see it almost like a sacramental idea here. This is Christ among us, right? And of course, every Christian is Christ among us. But here's the new member of the community, the new manifestation of the incarnation. It's beautiful. All right, so then, uh, we hear about the prophetess Anna as well, who, uh, who announces this good news. Verse 39, verse 39. 
when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own city, Nazareth. So, Often when we hear these stories, it kind of it's hard to keep track of where are they from, where are they going, what's happening. Matthew's gospel simply tells us that Joseph had a dream. Uh, Mary had conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph in his dream was uh, was uh, was told clearly this is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we hear, hear that Mary gave birth. That's it. Uh, we don't know where it's happening or what, right? That little episode there is kind of inserted into uh, what would be Luke, right between Luke 1 and 2, basically. Then we come to Matthew chapter 2, and we hear about a um, about magi coming, right? The magi, these wise men, come uh, looking for Jesus about uh, a year later. We talked about this, right? About a year later, the wise men come. It no longer is a, cha- a baby, but a child. They're no longer in a cave or a stable. They're in a house. We talked about this in our earlier studies. So they would have remained in Bethlehem for quite some time. They're there in Bethlehem. There's the circumcision. Then they go to Jerusalem, which is just down the street from Bethlehem, 40 days later. And then they would have returned to Bethlehem because we know from Matthew's gospel that eventually the Magi show up and show up in Bethlehem. Eventually, uh, they go down to Egypt. And then after Egypt, they go back and they return to Nazareth. That's how Matthew's gospel concludes, right? So the return to Nazareth, that's this little episode here, the return to Nazareth. So the trip to Egypt is would be right here in between verse 38 and 39. Okay? They said, well, why doesn't Luke tell us about that? Well, because Luke is interested in talking to you about other things that he sees important. Matthew doesn't tell you about St. Simeon. He doesn't tell you about the shepherds. Luke doesn't tell you about the Magi, nor the trip to Egypt, right? They have different uh, stories in the life of Jesus that they see important for showing their particular audience what they want to show their audience about Jesus. They can't tell you every single thing that happened in the life of Jesus, and they did, then you know, I mean, it, as St. John says, the, the books could not, and the world, you know, the world couldn't contain the books. So they pick little stories about the life of Jesus in this early period and, and show you what they see as important for their audience. Luke's audience is different than Matthew's audience. Matthew's audience is a Jewish Christian audience, a Palestinian Christian audience, that is interested in knowing about a trip to Egypt, taken care of by a, a Joseph whose father's name is Jacob, right? This is all very important imagery from Genesis and Exodus. And now they're going to come out of Egypt and all of that. We talked about that uh, before. Luke's gospel and Luke's audience, different. Luke's audience is primarily a Gentile audience or a Hellenized Jewish audience in Asia Minor and Paul's churches up in that region. And so Luke, while he does use the Old Testament heavily, he tends to explain a little more than Matthew does, and he certainly doesn't have it so heavily layered uh, as Matthew does from the Old Testament imagery because no one will be able to follow him of his audience. Okay? All right, so then, verse 39, they return to Nazareth. This would be parallel to the end of Matthew chapter 2 where they return to Nazareth. Okay, so then we also find that about 12 years later, they're going to come back to Jerusalem. Why are they going to do this? Well, every year at the Feast of Passover, right? Remember, if you go back to Exodus chapter 23, there were three major feasts in the early festal cycle of Israel. It's recorded in Exodus chapter 23 and Deuteronomy 16. Passover, Pentecost, and what's the third one? Do you remember? Passover, Pentecost, and 
It's a good tabernacles or sukkoth or huts, booths, right? These are three important feasts. We talk about them in our, you know, when, we, when we've when we had studies on the, the early prayer life of the church. There's some recorded on the website. And then we'll talk about this again when we come to the Feast of Theophany and the revelation of God dwelling among his people, which is what Tabernacles, the Feast of Sukkoth, was all about. And, uh, and we'll talk again about that early church festal cycle, how they celebrated those feasts as well, and how we do today as well in that many ways. All right, so then it says, Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. This was a pilgrim feast. You were supposed to, if you could, if you lived nearby, come to Jerusalem those three times out of the year. And, of course, Nazareth is not too far from Jerusalem, a couple days' journey. Verse 42, And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. Now, 12 years old, they could be just telling us that he went up, he was 12, he just wants to give us some chronology here, but it says according to the custom. It could be the custom of coming to Jerusalem for Passover, but it could also be, as some have suggested, a reference to the custom of bringing a young boy when he was old enough to the temple to come and and, uh, or to Jerusalem also and obey the command now. He was old enough. And today in modern Jewish uh, language, this is called the bar mitzvah. The bar mitzvah, the, which is actually Aramaic, not Hebrew, the son of the commandment. So he's now a son of commandment. He now follows the commandments. He's now obligated to keep the law. Uh, might be something like that. Who knows? But anyway, they come to Jerusalem and they stayed there and then they left. And unfortunately, they lost the Messiah. So they head off home and as they're heading home, they realize that he's not among their relatives or anything. It had been a long wagon train, you know, headed from Nazareth to Jerusalem and then back. They figured he was along, you know, with his relatives or something, but he wasn't there. So verse 46, they returned to Jerusalem, and for three days they looked for him. They found him eventually sitting in the temple among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Now, When you hear that in modern English, listening to the teachers and asking questions, you think of a modern school classroom. The teacher is teaching, and then the students are asking questions, right, to learn. But if you know about the rabbinic style of discussion, it's all about questions, right? So Jesus is there with the teachers of the law, but he's not learning. He's teaching, through questions. Think of, for example, in the New Testament later on, you'll see when the Pharisees come to Jesus, they don't say, your disciples are breaking the law, for they do not wash their hands when they eat. Or they're breaking the custom of the elders, the tradition of the elders. No, they say, why do your disciples not keep the tradition of the elders, right? They want to have a debate. And Jesus doesn't say, oh, let me tell you why, period. No, he always tells them why with a question mark. Right? He says, and why do you transgress the commandments of God for the sake of your traditions? Then he goes on to talk about Isaiah and things like that. Right? Think of later on, uh, toward the end of his ministry, uh, how the, the, uh, the authorities, the religious authorities say, tell us. How long will you keep us in suspense? Are you the Christ or not? And he says, you tell me. I'll ask you a question. If you answer it, then I'll, I'll uh, tell you. So he says, what was the baptism of John? From whence did it come? Heaven or from earth? And they were afraid to answer. So they didn't answer. They said, we don't know. Well, you do know, but you don't want to answer. So he says, then... I'm not going to answer your question. Right? This, is how they, this is how they dialogue, right? All right, so then he's asking them questions, and it's obvious that that's what they, they expect you to, to see here. He's talking to the teachers of law, and he's asking them questions. He's teaching the teachers. And you can see, look what it says. Uh, and all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Well, who's the one answering? If he's asking questions and the teachers are, right, you can see again, the teachers are the ones who are learning from him. 
They're getting the answers from him through his questions. You see how it works? All right. Anyway, I just point that out because sometimes people hear that and they, I thought Jesus would have known these things, wouldn't he? Well, yeah, of course. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been looking for you anxiously. Can you imagine? Right? They've been waiting for the Messiah for 500 years, and now they lost him. Right? A little boy in Jerusalem. Where's the Messiah? I don't know. So, I'm sure they were nervous. And he said to them, How is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Hmm. Now, what that's what Luke's hoping probably that you're going to think back to is the earlier part of the story. Remember, remember that the earlier part of the story in chapter one, we heard about this hymn, what we call the Magnificat. Often, that Magnificat is a is a play off of the hymn, the Magnificat of Hannah. Remember in First Samuel, in First Samuel, Hannah. Do you remember the story of Hannah? She was she had a husband, and uh, they uh, they went to the place uh, to offer sacrifice. And Hannah prays. Hannah prays. Right? Why does Hannah pray? She's barren. She has no child. And then there's a fulfillment. She conceives miraculously. Now, it's not a virgin birth, but she was a barren. They had no children. The, the other wife of this man had had five kids already. They obviously been married for a while. Hannah has no kids. And she's praying. And Ellie prays for her. And she, and she then goes home and she conceives in a natural manner, but obviously by the hand of God, the power of God, a great miracle. So you have a miraculous conception. Then you have uh, Hannah takes the boy, this is Samuel, and puts him, it says, loans him to the Lord, which is where we get that name Samuel, Shamuel, given to God. He's given back to God. She said, he gave him to me, I'm giving him back. So after he was weaned, after he was old enough to be on his own, separate from his mother, she takes him back and she leaves him there with Eli, right? And then you have the rest of the story of Samuel, you know, him sleeping in the holy place and all that stuff, right? Later on stories that come back in a second. So, uh, so then the end of the story in Luke's gospel here, this infancy narrative, is trying to remind us of that Jesus is the new Samuel. He's left in the place of the Lord, in the Lord's temple, where he must dwell among, with the Lord, with his Father. And so then you even get, look at this last line here, verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and favor with God and man. That's a play off of 1 Samuel 2.26, which is the conclusion of the story of Samuel being left in the temple. And Samuel grew up a strong, good boy and things like that. So Luke's hoping you're going to catch these parallelisms because we talked before. Hannah, remember the name Hannah, Chain, means grace. Chana is just the feminine form, grace. And she has that beautiful long hymn. She has this boy, a very special boy, who's going to be uh, taking over for Eli, the priest, right? And, and he's going he's gonna, to uh, be a, a prophet and priest for the people of God. And then, um, uh, and then Hannah has that beautiful hymn of thanksgiving. And at the end of that hymn, do you remember the end of Hannah's hymn? You get the first occurrence in the whole Bible of the word Messiah or Christ. They say, well, how would, I mean, really? I mean, that's kind of cool. But I mean, would you think Luke's audience could pick up really on something like that? Well, yeah. Because remember the audiences, the intended audiences of the New Testament Luke's audience, Matthew's audience, Mark's audience, Paul's audience. These people knew what you and I call the Old Testament like the back of their hand. How could they? I mean, who has time to read the Old Testament, have it all memorized? Well, first of all, there was no MTV, right, for when you're an adult. 
nor Donahue or Oprah or whatever people are watching it. And there was no, no Sesame Street or electric company when you were a kid. Or Barney or whatever kids are watching. So the, the people from when they were babies to adults... All the stories they ever heard, the bedtime stories, this when they would sit on their dad or mom's lap and they would start to read to them a story. They didn't read it. They just told the story of David, the story of Samuel. And they had these stories memorized. And when they, when, you know, the kid was having trouble sleeping, mom would start singing a psalm. They knew the psalms. These were their songs. We have in modern Christianity today, you know, a myriad upon myriad upon myriad of never-ending inventions of new songs. Which, you know, I guess is kind of nice because it's kind of, you know, you always it's always fresh and new and whatever, but is that really what the faith is all about? Fresh and new? I don't think so. The faith is something we've been handed on from the fathers of the church and from the apostles. St. Paul said, Hold fast to the traditions I have given to you, whether they were delivered to you by word of mouth or by epistle, right? He says, this is to the Thessalonians. He says to the Corinthians, I commend you, Corinthians. And he commends them on very few things, of course. (laughs) I commend you, Corinthians, for you hold fast to the traditions I've handed to you. What are we talking about? Well, what psalms do you sing at various parts of the church gathering? How do you baptize? How do you do all these things? These things are preserved, of course, also not only in the New Testament, but also in the early church writings. You know of the literature we call the Apostolic Fathers. The Apostolic Fathers. These are the guys who were taught about Jesus by the apostles themselves. Right? John the Apostle, Ignatius of Antioch, right? The Bishop of Antioch. You've got these guys who knew the apostles, heard them preach, were around even before some of the stuff was written down. Who is better to tell us what the apostles taught and what they meant in the New Testament? Me? You? Or a burning in the bosom? Tingling in the toes? Right? As the Mormons would have you, you know, a little indigestion or something? No. What's going to tell you what, what this means authoritatively and much more clearly is some guy from the first and second century who knew these individuals, who were taught by them, trained by them. This is why when we're after the Feast of Theophany, in a few weeks when we're done with the the Feast of Theophany, the baptism of our Lord, we're also uh, going to be done with our series of studies of the texts here. As you know, the very next story is about the baptism here after these infancy narratives. We'll be done with the Nativity series, and then we will also then pick up and start reading from there. We'll do a little study of what's called the Apostolic Fathers. Uh, You can pick them up on the bookshelf. I have some there. I'll order some more. The little set from Penguin Classics of the Apostolic Fathers. Wonderful little ancient uh, little book that is a collection of the writings of the individuals, the disciples of the Apostles really, really valuable resources for us today as Christians when you find over 40,000 different denominations out there, right? How many different types of Baptists are there? I have no idea. How many different types of Presbyterians are there? I heard a Presbyterian once say, uh, as a joke, and the Presbyterian said it, so I can say it, we're the split peas, Right? There's so many different types of Presbyterians. The split peas, get it? The the split pea soup, you know? So, um, because there's about 30, I think there's about 30 different types, you know, of major Presbyterian denominations. There are over 40,000, probably uh, 45,000 by now, different Protestant, or just, we'll just say, just denominations of Christianity out there. Who's right? The Baptist? The Lutheran? Pick which one, Missouri Synod, American Evangelical, who knows? Uh, the, one of the Presbyterians, uh, the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Roman Catholics, Greek Orthodox, the Russians, who knows what? How, how are we to discern this stuff? Well, it's not that complicated. All you do is you read the literature of the earliest, of the earliest disciples of the apostles. And that collection I told you is called the Apostolic Fathers. 
You can, it's here, like I said, in the bookshelf, but you also get on Amazon or something. You read there, and you see how the early church baptized. You read there, and you see how the early church celebrated their Eucharistic gatherings. You read there, and you find a church that fits hand in glove with what you and I call the New Testament. No surprise, because these are the disciples who were trained by the authors of what you and I call the New Testament, and it's those very individuals, those apostolic fathers, that collected what you and I call the New Testament and read it at their gatherings and gave it to us. Without them, we wouldn't have a New Testament. We wouldn't know anything about Jesus. And so obviously their witness is extremely important for, for us today and especially with the fragmentation of Christianity. That's the umpire right there. Not my interpretation of, you know, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 or your interpretation of first, but rather how did those who knew Paul understand 1 Corinthians chapter 1? Okay, so then that is uh, the end of Luke chapter 2. So we've read the infancy narratives in preparation for the celebration of the baptism, or the, the nativity of our Lord, God the Savior, in the flesh. We looked at Matthew chapters 1 and 2, and then we looked at Luke chapters 1 and 2. We were able, of course, if you were with us through the whole study, to go through Luke chapters 1 and 2 very quickly, because we had spent so much time carefully going through Matthew chapters 1 and 2, and of course there's lots of repeated information. The idea of the, the Christ, the son of David, son of Abraham, the concept of the Savior, the good news, all of this stuff we talked about in our earlier studies together. Uh, you can look at your, again, for just some structural context here, look at chapter 3 of Luke. What's the very next story? The baptism of Jesus. The baptism of Jesus. Look at Matthew's uh, gospel. Flip back to Matthew chapter 1. We read together weeks ago, Matthew chapters 1 and 2. Look at Matthew chapter 3. There's the baptism story. This is why the church will celebrate, also of course, as soon as we're done celebrating the nativity of our Lord, we're going to be celebrating on January 6th what we call the Theophany. Theophany or epiphany. These are both Greek words that basically have the same idea. A theophany, phania, uh, revelation, and then the uh, an epi above or theo, God. Right. So, revelation from above, epiphany, or revelation of God, theophany. Right. When you when Jesus is baptized in the Jordan and the Father's voice speaks and the Spirit descends, right? So from the early Christians, they saw the baptism of Jesus as this revelation that God was dwelling among them. This was the fulfillment for them of the Feast of Tabernacles. And we'll talk more about that and how they celebrated that feast and the relationship to Tabernacles, uh, although it happened at a different time of year, different time of year, um, uh, in the early church when we uh, have our study of that feast.